Well, here we are this Sunday looking at part two of looking for the right one. And if you notice in your bulletin outline, especially the sermon insert, it says another come and see lesson. For those of you who were here last week, you discovered that Philip went and grabbed his friend Nathaniel and said, come and see. Come and see the Messiah. Come and see the one who's changed my life. And here's going to be another come and see lesson. However, if you have your sermon outline, you'll notice that there's no scripture there before you, just the reference. Well, the scripture is so long, I couldn't put it in the outline. And let me just say this, the word of God is far more powerful than anything I can ever share from this pulpit. I believe it's my job to help you understand what is going on in God's Word. But the Word of God, as it's being written and being spoken, is a wonderful thing. And I trust as we share it together, it will speak into your heart. John 4, 5 through 30, and you're going to see it here on the PowerPoint. You can follow along as I read it. Eventually, he came to the Samaritan village of Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat weirdly beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please, give me a drink. He was alone at the time because his disciples had gone to the village to buy some food. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you, and who you are speaking to, you would ask me, and I would give you living water. But sir, you don't even have a rope or a bucket, she said, and this well is very deep. Where would you get this living water? And besides, do you think you're greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us this well? How can you offer better water than he and his sons and his animals enjoy? Jesus replied, anyone who drinks this water will soon become thirsty again. But those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh, bubbling spring within them, giving them <laughs> eternal life. Please, sir, said the woman. Give me this water, then I'll never be thirsty again, and I won't have to come here to get water. And there's a purpose she even said that, and we'll get into that here in a few moments. Go and get your husband, Jesus told her. I don't have a husband, the woman replied. And Jesus said, you're right, you don't have a husband, for you have had five husbands, and you aren't even married to the man you're living with now. You certainly spoke the truth. Sir, the woman said, you must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship? Well, we Samaritans claim it's right here at Mount Gizerim, where our ancestors worshipped. <laughs> Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship while we Jews know all about it, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who worship Him that way, for God is spirit. So those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. <coughs> Just then his disciples came back, and they were shocked to find him talking to a woman. But one of them had the nerve to ask, what do you want with her, or why are you talking to her? The woman left her water jar beside the well and ran back to the village telling everyone, come, and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Well, I'm going to speak just a few moments to gentlemen here 
Because you need to understand that Thursday is Valentine's Day. So if you haven't done anything yet, I'm giving you fair warning. You have a few days to go out there and buy something for your wife. I don't have to really remind the ladies. They already have it on your calendar. It's already registered somewhere uh, in their persona. But guys, sometimes you need a little bit of help. So Thursday is Valentine's Day. And because this is about looking for the right one, I discovered a couple of hilarious illustrations uh, for this morning. One is a man by the name of Reed Harris, who asked his fiance, Caitlin Whipple, to marry him. But he wanted to make the proposal something special, but he didn't plan it out very well, because the proposal was going to be at a Wendy's. Secondly, he hid the wedding ring in her frosty milkshake. Then he invited some of her friends to join him at Wendy's. But unbeknown to him, the friends decided they were going to have a competition on who could down the frosty the quickest. So, in the process, she swallowed her wedding ring. They rushed her to the hospital, took x-rays, sure enough, she swallowed the wedding ring. However, two days later, she discovered it. <laughs> you figured that one out. <laughs> and they did get married in June, when it was warm, and Frosties were not on the menu. The second story I heard is about a young man who had a creative and imaginary way of proposing to his fiance. However, it triggered several UFO reports in a small town in Germany. Bavarian police say that several people called on a Wednesday night to alert them to a strange flowing glow of lights across the city of Platte. It turns out that the lights were actually 50 paper lanterns he set afloat for his proposal. The police didn't identify the guy nor the fiance. However, they reported that the woman did say yes. <laughs> Let me ask this. If someone talked to your girlfriend or boyfriend, if you're not married yet, or to your spouse, how would you rate on a scale of 1 to 10 if these questions were posed? Will I be willing to get up in the middle of the night with screaming kids and allow my partner to rest? Hmm, good question. <laughs> Will I go to an activity that they love and I hate for hours and hours and hours? Will I take time to listen about their day and be willing to openly share about my day. Now the next one is kind of interesting because there is something, I believe in most homes, maybe not all, but it's one of the most valuable item in the home. More than rubies and diamonds. I, I've actually had to counsel people because of the way they attack one another over this item. The remote control. So, would you be willing to surrender the remote control, give up its power in the home for the sake of your partner? And there's a million other things where you should be putting your partner first and your own desires last. Can you say, I do to that? Well, this really brings me into my scripture text because the lady in our story either had a hard time being the right one or finding the right one. So let's break down our scripture. The thing that I discovered first and foremost is the unusual hour in which she came to the well. It was high noon in Jerusalem and a very hot day. I suppose it was also high noon in the life of this woman who was coming to the well on this occasion. She crossed the parched earth walks towards the water well located at the edge of town. It's the same well that Jacob gave to his favorite son Joseph, and that well still exists today, 96 feet deep. The Samaritan woman came alone. Why? I mean, why didn't she come when the other ladies came? They all came early in the morning, in the cool of the morning, with their water pots, grabbed what they needed for 
for their daily activities, their daily needs. This woman came alone at that horrendous hour in the heat of the day because she was considered an outcast in her village. Notice what the scriptures said. She'd been married five times, not one of them is Mr. Wright, and her reputation around town really wasn't the greatest. It was pretty low. She wasn't a respectable woman. And therefore, she arrived at that hour so that they couldn't be gossiping about her or harassing her as she was trying to gain access to the well. So as she approached the well, she carried a heavy clay water pot. But you know, if I want to draw an illustration from this, I think she also carried a heavy burden in her heart. Probably walking that day with so many regrets, things that had gone wrong, things that she tried to fill that void of contentment and happiness and peace that just simply backfired. It wasn't working for her. So she comes at the noon hour, the heat of the day, by herself. You know, rejection brings its own set of pain, doesn't it? Some of you have experienced rejection before. When we're rejected, there's that abandonment. We don't belong. We're isolated. But also loss. Loss of connection with family and friends and community. Well, here we have an unnamed woman experiencing all of those. Therefore, she went to the well at such an unusual hour of the day. But the second thing that came to mind is this unusual encounter that took place. First of all, the woman thought she was going to be all by herself. Nobody goes to the well at noon. And then, definitely, she did not expect to see a man at the well, especially at this time of day. And third, the man being Jewish actually begins a conversation with her which is really a surprise on two different levels. One, she was a Samaritan. Secondly, she was a woman. Now, I've shown this before. Jews and Samaritans, they were at war with each other. They despised one another. These are enemies. They're not even neutral in their feelings. But women in that day and age had no rights, no privileges. In fact, when Jewish priests prayed, they had a list of things that they praised God for as they boasted about who they were. At the bottom of the list are two things, and nobody's for sure what order they're in. They would praise God that they weren't a dog, and praise God they weren't a woman, or a woman or a dog. Nobody knows which. So for Jesus, a Jew, talking to her a Samaritan and a woman, absolutely blew her out of the water, so to speak. And notice from our text how Jesus gradually moves the conversation from mere introductions about water to revealing her deepest spiritual need. Now, there's a section I read that you're saying, what was that in there for? That doesn't make any sense about worshiping God in Jerusalem or Mount Gerizim. What's all that got to do? Well, let me just kind of boil it down for you. As this woman was approaching Jesus and trying to get some answers to life, he was simply saying, you're trying to defend your religion, you're trying to defend your rituals, you're trying to defend your customs, but I want you to know whether you're Jew or Samaritan, rituals, customs, and religion, or whatever else you want to invent to replace God, the true living God, will never stand. And then he goes on to declare that he is the living water, which prompts from this woman the right response. She truly desired something or someone to bring a sense of commit or contentment and happiness to her life. Her five past experiences turned out no good. And I gather that number six wasn't so charming either. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He further tells us that real worship, true worship towards God, is worshiping in spirit 
and in truth. In other words, our relationship with Jesus Christ being our Savior doesn't start or stop there. It starts there. And it continues even further as we venture forth and respond to God's grace. You see, worship is much deeper than simply a religious ritual. What we did this morning wouldn't have any merit or value unless we sensed God's presence right in the midst of our worship. That we knew offhand that God indeed was in the house. And that's why we lifted our praise. That's why some started to clap to the song because the Holy Spirit is moving within. Worship has to be an experience with God that transforms you and I at heart level. Now, when our kids were growing up, Penny's mom and dad pastored a church in San Dimas, California. And oftentimes, whether it be Christmas or Easter, we would take a trip to California with our kids and enjoy the celebrations with family. But I say that every time we went, we made it a point to go to Disneyland. Now, if you're unaware with Disneyland, they have a monorail that goes all around the park. So you get in the monorail and see the park from the monorail. Now what would have happened if I told my four kids, we're going to ride the monorail all day and just look at Disney. This is the Magic Kingdom, but we're just going to ride the monorail. I don't have to walk. I got you all cuddled in one place. I'll have to figure out if somebody's going to get lost. We're in the monorail. That is dumb. Who wants to ride a monorail all day when you can go in and enjoy and participate the Magic Kingdom? I mean, there's Space Mountain, Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, the expression on our kids' face as they go Splash Mountain. I mean, all these things were available, but they had to get off the monorail and enter the park to enjoy them. I guess my connection is a lot of us just kind of observe worship. We just kind of ride this train around the church. When Jesus is saying, participate. Join in. Be a part of. Let worship be an inward devotion more than just an outward expression. You know, the Apostle Paul, whenever he wrote a letter, always had a specific salutation. He would begin a letter oftentimes greeting in the name of blank and Savior. Well, let me help you fill in the blank. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Think of that for a moment. Christ as our Lord? That's an entirely different title, isn't it? Being my Savior doesn't really require a whole lot from me. It's just my response of faith, and that's when coming to my life. But being his servant, because he's my Lord, ah, that's a totally different story. And in case you may not think that this is really important, let me help you understand. The word Savior appears 55 times in the Bible. Not bad if you ask me. But the word Lord appears 800 times in the Bible. It's the single most important thing you and I can do, says Jesus, is to honor him as our Lord, as well as our Savior. And then, an unusual evangelist. This woman was so impacted by the words of Jesus that she ran back to her village. Notice that she's no longer ashamed of what she was, not embarrassed about any gossips, whispers, or anything else that might happen. She's empowered by the Holy Spirit and takes off towards her village. She also left behind her clay water pot at the well. My friends, let me say this. When you've given your life to Jesus Christ, leave all the other garbage behind. Leave it there. Don't take it with you. Don't pick it up and drug all that burden back with you. Simply say, here it is, Jesus. It's yours. Thank you so much for lifting this burden, the guilt, the regret, whatever it is, and then take off and be an expression of the love of Jesus Christ. 
She was bubbling with living water. And her first instinct is, i got to share this with those I know, with my community. It was this very desire to tell others, I think, that actually wiped away her feelings of shame and guilt. Ah, once an outcast, her way of life made her totally unacceptable to everyone that she knew. But once she found forgiveness through Jesus Christ, she forgets all of this. And she is filled with wonder and gratitude and amazement. So she went and told everybody about the one she met at the well. And I kind of paraphrase it this way. Look at what I was. Look at who I am now. This is what Jesus has done for me. And so radiant was her testimony with so much excitement that everyone saw the change in the woman. And the reason I say that is if there was a person of ill repute that you knew for a long time and they came and talked about the change that Jesus brought, if it wasn't something you really witnessed, you'd just say, oh, forget you. But what did these people do? They ran to the well to see this Jesus. In other words, they knew from the life change that was being expressed that moment, this woman was indeed different. And what was her expression? Come and see. Come and see. Just like Philip saying to Nathaniel, I can't even put it in words. You've got to come and see for yourself. Come and see this one who indeed is the Messiah. Well, I'm going to ask the praise team to come to the platform right now because there are some wonderful lessons to be drawn from what we've just talked about this morning. As empty as this woman must have been, Jesus still met her where she was. And he filled the void that she tried to fill with so many other things, with relationships, affection, acceptance, whatever it was that wasn't satisfying Jesus himself filled that void. I want you to know, folks, he's here today. And if you've come with any kind of emptiness, if you come with some hurts and pains and wondering, man, I've tried so many things, it's just not working, Jesus is in this place. Arms stretched out, invitation being spoken. Come, come and see how I can give you what you've been looking for all your life. So the invitation's there this morning. But once we have the good news, wow, once we're redeemed, the message of Jesus Christ is something that we want to share with others. In fact, a sub-model of our church is to love Jesus deeply that you express him vividly. I want us to love Christ with all of our heart that when we go out, we're excited about what he's done and we share with that kind of excitement. You and I have known too many people who profess to be Christians who have a sour face. Greed? In fact, I use the expression they could suck golf balls out of gopher holes. I mean, your face hangs down that low. That's not what God intends. He wants us to have a vibrant relationship he wants there to be excitement and enthusiasm. And you know that word enthusiasm is actually a spiritual word? You know, the secular society is taking it from us. And, E-N means in. Enthusiasm is a, the root is theo, God. Which means in God. Enthusiasm comes when we have a relationship in God. Third, Never stop thirsting for a deeper relationship with Jesus. Always, always, every day, every moment, ask for more of Him. In some of the churches that Perry and I pastored, she would allow me, I don't know why, to sing with her. And one of the songs that we would sing is a song entitled, More of You. Let me just share the lyrics with you this morning. I've searched all around in the husks that abound, but I find no nourishment there. 
Now my strength's almost gone, and I feel the pull of despair. But my thirst drives me on as I stumble along over ground so barren and dry. But the streams just ahead, living water, Lord, fill me, I cry. More of you, more of you. I've had all but what I need, just more of you. Of things I've had my fill, and yet I hunger still. Empty and bare, Lord, hear my prayer for more of you. And then last, there can be no conversion without conviction. Have you ever wondered in this story, when they're talking about Jesus as the Messiah, and the woman is asking more questions, that all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Jesus says, go get your husband. It's like, where did that come from? Why should we go get her husband? What Jesus was doing at that moment was bringing her to a point where she had to admit her own sin. She tried to evade the question at first by saying, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, well, that's true. But you've already had five, and who you're living with is not your husband. In other words, he wanted to draw out the fact that she needed to confess. Be honest, pour out her heart, all the garbage with it before Christ. With conviction and repentance, then there can be saving faith. Jesus not only aroused her mind and her emotions, he also had to arouse her conscience, and that meant dealing with her sin. And the same with us today. Unless we open up and confess to God, we're going to find ourselves constantly in a predicament, in a conundrum. So what might, lead your, what might lead be your need today? If you need salvation, Jesus is the Savior. If you somehow have kind of slipped from where you had been spiritually, and you need to get back on track, Jesus is the sanctifier. If you need release and freedom from that which enslaves you, Jesus is the deliverer. If you need a brand new physical touch, Jesus is the healer. So you see, whatever your need is today, Jesus is the answer. As we stand and close in song, the altar is always open. If God has been stirring in your heart and speaking into your life at this moment, and you know you've got some things you need to settle with him, we bid you come as the song of invitation is being sung.